Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Dual Access Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Ruth Amartefio from the Data School. Ruth was originally a member of DS15 and has now joined our coaching team. She's focusing on adaptability, inquisitiveness, and technical expertise. Ruth comes to us with a background in technical design. She was a tailor. She was an analyst and a private tutor of math and science. And she considers herself a jack of all trades, which I think we'll learn about in this interview. Thanks for joining me, Ruth. Good to be here. Thank you. So why do you like coaching? Why do I like coaching? Um, I, I guess I like I like explaining things because I, I don't like being confused. So I like having that feeling of figuring something out. I really enjoy that myself. And I like to see it in other people as well when they sort of get that moment where something becomes clear. Yeah. And, and how are you imparting that on your wisdom onto the data schoolers then? Um, I guess, the, the, how am I imparting my wisdom? I think mostly I'm trying to focus on discipline rather than, you know, there's, there's a mixture of trying to find interesting ways to explain things, find interesting ways for some, them to sort of have workbooks that are easy for them to understand, but mostly just teaching them to be disciplined in the way they think, because a lot of learning is remembering and you remember things better if you have your work in order. So it's actually understanding that, you know, just turning up to class doesn't mean they'll know right. something. Right. Okay. So it's the whole being organized, um, you know, where your resources are when you need them. And, and exactly. That. Yeah. And one of your focuses that, uh, that, that you've taken on since you've been helping us is on kind of user stories and working on requirements gathering. Mm -hmm. How have you gone about doing that and helping our consultants improve from that perspective? Um, so what a user story is, is basically when, when a DS or meets a client, first of all, before they solve their problem, they need to really understand what the problem is. So they have to make sure they understand where the client is coming from, what they want to happen. And when they get the piece of work, what exactly they're going to do with it. Cause sometimes they'll just sort of take the request at face value, but that doesn't actually translate to what the client needs. So we make sure before they start a project that they really think about you know, this is my role. These are all the different problems I want to solve. Um, and when you give me this piece of work, these are all the decisions I'm going to make. Because um, that helps them maybe use their own initiative when they realize, oh, you know, they haven't asked for this, but I can understand that this was my problem. I'd want to do X, Y, and Z as well. Right. And how do they take those user stories and then turn them into estimates? Estimates of like how long something takes. Yeah. Um, well, what they do is I guess they break it down into what what are sort of the, the 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 range of things they could do and then they start with saying okay well we could probably do this at a minimum let's see what the client thinks of this and then it's really important to go back and say as a minimum we're going to try to do this does this make sense and hopefully it doesn't make 100 percent sense because that's just uh, not how the real world works <laughs> so the client will say yes give me 80 percent of this but can you you know tack on this extra um and then they sort of, it's just a Marco Polo thing. They have to just trial and error. And I think that's probably what they find most difficult is knowing there's no right answer for how long something should take. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they get very, maybe they get a bit worried when they can't get it right the first time, but they have yeah. to understand that you try the next time it's much longer, the next time it's much shorter. Right, right. And yeah. I guess one of the things I try to emphasize to them that they're they're called estimates for a reason because yeah. they're they're inherently wrong. Yeah. But you just get better and better at estimating by estimating more and more. Exactly. Sometimes um, it's hard. It's hard to get that through to them that okay, well, I have to deliver this whole piece of work rather than thinking about okay, this is my time I have allocated for the week. This is how much it's going to take me. How do I manage that scope with the customer to make sure that they get the best value for what they're looking for? And I think as well, what they find difficult is that they are still trainees and. When you're when you're preparing your application, you know, you're staying up all night, you're doing all of these things that you see you do in one hour on YouTube and you say, OK, this takes Andy one hour. It takes me nine hours in those nine hours. I'm producing one hour of work. Yeah. So they go to the client and they think I now need to work three times as long to produce a decent amount of work. And what, what's, what we're saying to them is give them what takes you a day. That's what mm -hmm. you're offering them, what takes exactly. you a day, not what yeah. would take Andy a day. Right. I think that's what they find hard is they overwork trying to sort of deliver what they, they yeah. think you would do or something. Right. And we also have an issue sometimes of them working past hours, mm -hmm. which then it looks like they're delivering, they're delivering in a project more than uh, they actually really were. If that makes sense, they're kind of mm -hmm. working overtime and to the customer, it looks like, oh, this is the allocated time they had 
wow, look at all they can do. And it can be a bit misleading, which can then lead to them over over committing at uh, once they're in placement or ultimately working for free because they're working overtime. How have you helped them manage through that? Yeah, I mean, I do remind them that if they want to get to, get to work for five pounds an hour, that's what they're doing. Um, and also they won't be able to, sometimes you do need to go above and beyond. And if your baseline is above and beyond, how do you ever sort of pull something out of the bag because you're already at right. your limit? Right. Um, and there's also, there is a point, you know, where you go beyond your sort of marginal returns where they're not even, they're not even producing good work. They're just guilty in front of a computer, afraid right. to leave. Right. And they don't have right. time to reflect. Um, so like what, one thing I, I try, I really like is the Pomodoro method where you estimate how long something will take and then you see how wrong you were. But over a period of getting it wrong five times in a row, you realize, you know, there's actually a, a sort of an element of random chance that goes into every estimate that you just have right. to accept. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, I think the most important thing is just reminding them that they, they can't overwork because you don't actually get that value back. Yeah. And when you were in placement, did you have any customers that you thought were kind of expecting you to work extra time? Or how did you manage through those projects when maybe there was a deadline um, and you needed to manage the scope or manage the customer's expectations? Yeah, it didn't. It, luckily for me, it happened towards the end of my placement rather than towards the beginning or, you know, all of my placements. So at the beginning, they were very well, they're very supportive. And sometimes I liked to stay late because I liked when everybody was gone and then I say, okay, now I can think right. properly. <laughs> um, so it was actually more comfortable for me. And sometimes people would say, you know, don't stay too late or we're all leaving now. Yeah. So I did feel very well supported in that respect. Um, there were other times where people above me were promising things on my behalf. Right. And I would have to say, this is not realistic. Yeah, we can't, you know, if you're promising this in two weeks, because I didn't know the story and I promised. And I always say that to people, if you promise something, you have to deliver. Right. So right. don't promise. Um, but once I did promise, I had to work a weekend, etc. I said, I've just worked a weekend to get this done because I went along with someone else's promises. Um, and I do think it's important to say it because they then offered me a day in lieu. And they were more serious okay. the next time when I said, look, I, I'm not going to keep doing this okay. because you have to promise realistically. So you went through a bit of a negotiation with them then? Bit of a negotiation. And I mean, I, I didn't ask for it because I, I had already given the time, but I made them understand that their time scales weren't realistic. Right. Um, but I've had had comments from other people that would say things like, oh, I wish I could work late, you know, but the doctor says I can't. Um, and mm. you think... That, that's something that if I were younger, I might not like to hear from somebody in the workplace, sort of, oh, you should be eager to get stuck into a problem. You should be grateful that you have these yeah. opportunities and just be careful that you you don't feel that you're under pressure from someone above to say you should be delighted to be in this opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, some people do love to throw themselves into the work. Sometimes you get stuck on something and you want to, you can't step away from it, but it should be your choice. Yeah, yeah. Going back to kind of b before your time in the DS and sort of where candidates are, are now that you're on the coaching side and you're doing interviews, you've, you've been in the role since the beginning of the year, you've probably easily done 100 interviews already. Um, what are some of the, what are some of the ways that people can either better prepare for the interview or yeah, let's start with that. What are some ways people could prepare for the interview better? Um, they, they know themselves and know the role. So from knowing the role, they have to really ask what is a consultant and what isn't a consultant? And also what are the best and worst things about being a consultant? Right. Because I think they they think I have a job. What do you do in a job? You go in and you do whatever somebody tells you to do. Right. But knowing what a consultant is in terms of, you know, good answers, people think about, we won't know what we're doing. We come in, someone has a problem. We use our creativity to help them solve it. We use the tools at our disposal to listen to their problems, to think right. about how we can help. Um, you know, I think what a consultant isn't is, you know, you don't get stuck into the company and become one of them. You, right. you always stay as an outsider. You always stay as sort of a bit set apart from them right. while still trying to get to know them. And then knowing yourself is really understanding what your strengths and weaknesses are. Because I think when you're starting to, when you go out on the road to employment, you just please accept me, just give me a job. 
But then sometimes you'll get a job and you think, how did these people think I belonged here? Like I'm right. insulted that they hired me. So I think it's important to know what you're actually not willing to do. You know, I'm not willing to to, to cold call companies. You know, yeah. would you like to buy our product? I, I wouldn't do it. Um, so I think a lot of people as well, they're more concerned with just getting a job rather than thinking, I'm going to give two to three years of my life to this place. It's really important that they know who I am. And if I'm not for them, don't, please don't let me get involved in this. Yeah, you know. yeah. Yeah. And as far as, you know, when we're doing the data school interviews, there's the, there's kind of the demonstration part of the interview. And then the, the questions are more around soft skills yeah. and consulting. Um, and do you find that people that do well in the interviews, let's say they do really well in the consulting part of the interview. For me, that's the more important part of the interview. We can teach them the, the presentations and the, and the, you know, the technical skills. That's more just to see how they, how they kind of present themselves and their confidence and things like that. But going into kind of the other questions, um, there's other soft skills that go into consulting as well. Like ultimately we're an advisor to the company. Mm -hmm. What are some of those other really important skills that a consultant needs to have? Curiosity. So, you know, everybody has the voice in the back of their mind that notices something's not right, but it's the ability to, no matter how shy you are, no matter, you know, how new you are to just say, hang on a second, uh, that doesn't make sense to me and not be afraid to look stupid. Mm -hmm. um, just if you're really, really curious to learn, that's always your priority. You don't care how you look. You just have to know the answer. Yeah. And I think that's the most important thing with consulting because you'll go into a business, they'll say things that don't make sense. And a lot of the times it's because it doesn't make sense. And it's just part of their culture of just kicking the can down the road. So you need to be able to say, um, that doesn't make sense to me and not feel like an idiot because a lot mm -hmm. of the times you'll catch them saying, yeah, we were hoping nobody would notice that and that needs mm -hmm. to be fixed. We talk a lot in the data school about imposter syndrome. I know you, mm -hmm. you didn't feel like you had it too much, but you know, you know, from your one-on-ones with, with the data schoolers and stuff, but it's, it's a pretty real thing. Does that also carry over into placements? Yeah, and I think that's probably where it happens the most. I mean, I think the reason why I, I feel like I didn't get imposter syndrome because the imposter syndrome says, you know, you feel like an imposter, but you're not. Whereas I felt like you are imposters. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a syndrome, it's real. Um, and, and I think that's just why an imposter. I, there was no syndrome to go exactly, with. Exactly. That's why I feel like saying, you know, if you feel you may feel like you're not good enough, but you are. And it's like, you may feel like you're good and you're not good enough. It's because you're not. Um, but the point is, is no everybody knows a bit of something and not a, and not a lot of something else and i think the hardest part is yeah turning up to placement and somebody saying here's our resident expert and you just think like don't say that about me <laughs> um and and i guess the the approach is just understanding that we're part of an organization and I, one thing i'm always saying to the to the consultants when they're preparing to go out on placement is you know that's a great question i'm going to get back to the team and, you know, maybe that's something for one of our core mm. experts Right. is to remind but them that okay you say you don't know something and that mm -hmm. you need to ask. It's OK to say you don't know something. Exactly. Say, I need to think about that. I need to go, you know, I need to go, you know, ask, ask for help or something like that. Exactly. And like training them maybe to ask a few intelligent questions before they go away. So should we should we do we need another node on our server? And the P1 is going in saying, I have no idea. I don't know. What's a node? <laughs> so you, you kind of, you can say things like, you can ask a few questions like, okay, why do you think you need that? What's been going on till now? You can ask a lot of general questions to get some information and then say, okay, I think this is a question for one of our core team experts. Yeah. I'm going to speak to them and see if we can arrange a call. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. enough that that's what your position is there. You're there for a conduit for the whole company. Right. And you don't have to straight away say, I don't know because that's not very helpful. Right, right. Um, but you also don't have to know. So I think that's where the kind of not feeling like an imposter, you're not the expert. Mm -hmm. You're you're an expert sort of consultant. And mm -hmm. that is, that's the things you can be experts, asking questions, getting information, right. and being a conduit between, between people who need to speak to each other. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that part of the consulting side where if you don't know something, you just got to ask questions to get enough information yeah. and go find the answer, right? Yeah. yeah, and a lot of the times they do know because they'll say, oh, you know, well, it's just because we started off with 50 users and now we've got 150 users and they're using it all the time. So you're like, right. 
okay, I think I know why people get nodes now. Let me go and speak to somebody. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's those type of things you can you can often ask your way out of a question. Yeah. Um, like there's a, there's an example Richard Feynman spoke about. You know, people always thought he was a genius, and he was looking. He was taking a tour of some new premises that was being built, and they showed him the plans, the blueprints. He was looking at the blueprints. He was like, I don't know what this is. And, you know, there was something to sort of an opening. And he was like, is this a vent or is this a window? And he didn't know what it was. And he just said, what happens if this gets blocked? And then they looked at it and they were like, oh, my God. You know, you've just pointed out a massive flaw and he's a genius. And it's just about just you know, the question. <laughs> just ask people when people explain themselves, they they answer their own questions a lot of the time. Yeah, so, yeah. Great. Just get you get good at asking questions. If you had to go through the data school again, let's say you're you're in your first day, your your uh, your your trainee Ruth. Yeah. What would you do differently? I would organize my folders so neatly. I would take note of everything on your, on your computer. I assume. Yeah. On my computer, yes. Um, I would take note of everything, and everything that I learned, I would sort of review it in real time that day at the end of the mm -hmm. day and catalog it, highlight what was missing and put it somewhere where I could easily review it. Because you, you learn so much that you just sort of, I'll, I'll deal with that later, I'll deal with it later, but the later yeah. never comes. So I, I think I would have liked to have a sort of a nicer set of my own personal resources for when I went mm -hmm. on placement to say, you know, I, I say that to everybody, you're not supposed to remember everything. You're supposed to remember where it is. Right, right. And when you go on placement, now they're asking you to do something with some table calculations you go and you learn it again. You look in your notes, you see what you wrote, you look at your yeah. own explanations that you reworded into your own language, and then you learn it and figure it out on the spot when you actually need it. Um, yeah. I wonder if if they were really organized like that when they take our quizzes, would it be, would the, surely the quizzes would be easier for them if they were really organized, right? For, for those of you, for those of you that are, that are listening, we give these quizzes uh, about halfway and three quarters of the way through training. And they're really difficult, but they're difficult on purpose because we want to identify the areas where we need to teach them more or where they need to improve as, as individuals. That's feedback to the coaches and, and we kind of help them develop from there. Um, but they, it is open book, except for, there's a couple of resources we restrict them from. So, and every, pretty much everything that we have on that quiz they've done before. So do you think it'd be much easier if they just had themselves organized? Absolutely, because it's just literally, okay, where was my section on, on time-based right. charts? I just go right. to my workbook and copy the solution. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it is surprising when people miss things or they, they don't seem to remember what they've done or... Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I definitely think just cataloging your work and not labeling it like day mm. one. But, you know, these are calculations, these are time based information, these are parameters. Yeah. Um, and taking advantage of how many resources there actually are, you know, floating around the business as well. OK, well, great. Thanks, Ruth. I appreciate your time and I will talk to you soon. All right. So see Bye. you soon. Thanks. Bye. You. Bye. Bye.